Okay, I think we're ready to go. If we can cut the music, thank you. It's wonderful to see everyone gathered here today. I'm John Fry, president of the university, and I want to, <clears throat> I'm sorry for my, my voice, by the way. I want to welcome you to the kickoff of the president's diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging uh, speaker series. I want to give special thanks to my colleagues, uh, Kim Golston. Kim is our vice president and chief diversity officer and uh, Leslie Ashbarnardo, who is our Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Patience Agile Foster, and everyone at the Office of Institutional Equity and Inclusive Culture for their stellar work in putting this program together and doing it so quickly. So it's, a, it's, a, it's really a, a wonderful idea, the first in the many of these conversations that we'll have. I saw my colleague, Angela Dow Burton, uh, one of our trustees, the chair of our Community Partnerships uh, Committee, who's here, Angela, welcome. Uh, and uh, we have a trustee of the Academy of Natural Sciences with us, Latasha Harling, who is also uh, going to be one of our panelists today. So Latasha, thank you for, for being with us. So we have, we have many, many reasons to study the lives of great trailblazers like Alice Coachman, sister Rosetta Tharp, Patricia Bath, and of course, Katherine Johnson. First, it affords us the thrill of learning about truly amazing people whose lives were often pushed to the margins of history. As Bell Hooks has noted, all too often the people at the margins are black women. How many of you knew, for example, that Alice Coachman was the first African-American woman to win a gold medal? Or that rock and roll pioneers like Chuck Berry, Little Richard, and Elvis Presley all credited African-American gospel and blues artist Sister Rosetta Tharp with creating the blueprint for rock and roll. Or that ophthalmologist Patricia Bath invented the device that enables the quick and virtually painless removal of cataracts. Dr. Bath, Bath was also the first African American woman to receive a medical patent and one of medicine's foremost innovators, research scientists, and humanitarians. And were it not for the widespread popularity of the movie adapt adaptation of African-American writer Margot Lee Shetterly's acclaimed book, Hidden Figures, some of us might never have learned about the brilliant African-American Nassau mathematician, Katherine Johnson. Without Katherine Johnson, the US space program might very well have sputtered to a halt. Fortunately, the space program had Katherine Johnson to do the math and play indispensable roles in sending American astronauts into space and returning all of them safely back to Earth. Everyone who has benefited from the medical, technological, and economic benefits generated by the space program owe Katherine Johnson, Mary Jackson, and Dorothy Vaughn a deep debt of gratitude. There are more reasons for us to learn more about Katherine Johnson and other pioneers like her. It affords us the opportunity to get our histories right. It compels us to acknowledge our debt of gratitude to each of them. And it allows us to recognize and be inspired by their incredible tenacity and courage in overcoming horrendous racism and sexism en route to changing the world. The movie Hidden Figures does not do full justice to Katherine Johnson's monumental efforts to leap over the barriers thrown in front of her, continuing her education earning advanced degrees, and prevailing in a workplace culture that was hardly inclusive or equitable. In her book, Shetterly writes, and I quote, I had, I had been the only black woman in enough drawing rooms and boardrooms to have an inkling of the chutzpah it took for an African-American woman in a segregated Southern workplace to tell her bosses she was sure her calculations would put a man on the moon. These women's paths set the stage for mine. Immersing myself in their stories helped me understand my own. Today, there is a growing movement across the country to gloss over, gloss over the legacy and realities of racism and sexism in our country. We see it in the battle of our, over how American history is taught in our schools, and we see it in the withering ridicule of efforts to advance diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in our organizations. How many times have you heard someone point to narratives like 
hidden figures as proof that we have come a long way to becoming a more free and fair and just society. And we have come a long way, but not as far as those who want to believe that we have come much farther. Racism and sexism have not dissipated, and the evidence is in plain sight all around us. We see it in racial disparities in health outcomes and educational attainment and in wealth. And we see it in the underrepresentation of women, black and brown people, and non-gender conforming people in STEM fields, in C-suites, in professional occupations, and so many other sectors of American society. What is more, the persistence of racism and sexism is holding our society back. Yes, in extending the frontiers of education, scientific discovery, and social progress, every one of our distinguished panelists stands on the shoulders of giants like Katherine Johnson who helped pave the way for their success. But for every one of our panelists, there are many, many other young African Americans and women who would also be making their mark on the universe had they been afforded the educational resources and encouragement and pathways to professional success that too many of us take for granted. That is why Drexel will never waver in our efforts to promote diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And that is the reason for launching this President's Speaker Series, to build up our awareness and resolve towards making Drexel a more powerful force for creating a freer, fairer, more innovative, and more just society. So let the learning begin. Thanks to all of you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I couldn't decide if I was going to need my glasses or not, but I think I'm okay. Um, so first of all, I just want to say thank you, President Fry. This man, uh, we just owe him a debt of gratitude for his ongoing leadership and commitment to Drexel for being an anti-racist university in times when it was popular to be in support of anti-racism and in ongoing times when some people thought and possibly hoped it was a passing idea that would fade from Drexel's strategic plan and priorities. You've been, your unwavering commitment to this work um, is why we're here. So thank you. The idea for the lecture series is a product of the work of Drexel's anti-racism task forces, faculty recruitment and retention subcommittee. They saw this as an opportunity for others in our community and throughout the country to participate with Drexel on its journey to be a premier university and a I'm sorry, to be a premier university for diversity and a culture of equity and inclusion in alignment with our strategic priorities. We hope that this lecture series will provide opportunities not only for building community across the university, as we will all be a part of the same conversation, but also for having the difficult conversations that matter and can lead to, social, can lead to solutions for change. When Dr. Leslie Ash Bernardo Vice Provost for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion started talking about the wonderful opportunity for us to honor Katherine Johnson. It immediately became clear to us that this would be our launch event for the President's Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Lecture Series. And I just want to say Leslie just joined us and she's already making moves, so thank you, Leslie. As we often say, this work can't be done by one person or one department. So we also want to thank the Drexel Solutions Institute because they connected Leslie with Mike Moore and the Truist team. And with Leslie's familiarity and experience and research regarding inclusive teaching, role models, and allyship, she envisioned a panel of inspiring black leaders whose lives and work in many ways parallel that of Katherine Johnson. The Offices for Institutional Equity and Inclusive Culture Protocol 
University Marketing Communications, and I have to give a shout out to Kate Martin from the Office of Faculty Advancement, pulled this event together with the same commitment that was shown in the original Anti-Racism Task Force. They believed in something, and everyone jumped in to make it happen. So without further ado, let me introduce you to some gate openers. People, you know, who, people who know how to make it happen for themselves and for others, something we all should aspire to do. So as I previously introduced Dr. Leslie Ar Ash Bernardo, our Vice Pro Provost for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and our panel facilitator for today, Mr. Michael Moore, Katherine Johnson's grandson, and a Senior Vice President and Director of Software Engineering at Truist Financial Corporation, Dr. Mugega Cooper, um, also known as Dr. Moo, an alumna of the College of College of Engineering, so she's one of our own, and a planetary protection engineer at NASA. Latasha Harling, a diversity and community impact consultant and member of the Board of Trustees of the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University. Dr. India Johnson, and I'm, I didn't go in order, so. <laughs> I apologize. Raise your hand, India. So Dr. India Johnson, a social psychologist at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, who studies what makes individuals role models and allies from the perspective of black women in STEM, and our very own Dr. Stephen Cox, who is the regional project director of the Greater Philadelphia Region, Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation, and is resident in the office of the provost. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Leslie. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I'm gonna jump right in because I am so excited, as I know you are, to hear these responses. So, Mike, I'm starting with you. Your grandmother, Katherine Johnson, was an extraordinary woman whose life and work opened doors for so many others. She was born in 1918, a time when opportunities were quite limited for women and African Americans. But thanks to her hard work and mathematical mind, she was one of three black students selected to integrate the graduate program at West Virginia University. Fast forward to 1953, when she began work at Langley's West Area Computing Section at the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which later became NASA. And we've already heard about some of her amazing accomplishments there. These are facts about her. But tell us what Katherine Johnson meant to you. What would you like us to know about her, and how did she influence you? Um, well, probably um, not known by many. First of all, she never talked about any of this stuff. <laughs> so um, to me, she was casserole bacon, cake bacon. Grandma. Peanut plain <laughs> grandma. Yeah. That was it. Mm -hmm. A heck of a musician. Um, um, the most organized, it, it makes sense now, but at the time I couldn't tell how she could be a CPA, run a trucking company, do 18 million different people's books, yeah. do crossword puzzles and still go to work nine to five like everybody else. And um, she was just a throwback and a renaissance woman at the same time. Um, I thought everybody's grandma tutored them all the way through college and graduate school. <laughs> I didn't. Nope. Oh, it was just a coincidence she could do Fourier transforms and calculus. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I think the thing I got from her, I got a lot of things from her, but I think the thing that I got from her mostly was an appreciation of the objectivity of math. You know, unlike history and English and those things that are subjective and allow not to pick on professors, but folks to judge your words and your positions. Right. Math is about um, as real a meritocracy in terms of education as you can get. Two plus two is four in the worst school in America and in the most affluent school in the country. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing in between that separates that. Yeah. And so when you, have, when you work in an area that has that level of absolute truth, mm -hmm. Um, it removes a lot of barriers that separate educational levels. And so if you're good, if you um, are one of the best in an area of STEM or in science or technology, as much as people may not like you or people that look like you or people that come from where you come from, what they can't deny 
is your greatness. Yeah. And they're not so self-destructive that they don't want you anyway, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. so to me, it is the great equalizer. Yeah. And she allowed me to embrace math in that value and then make it my own. Mm -hmm. And so it then became the foundation of everything I did beyond that. Yeah. Thank you. Mu, Dr. Moo, you have worked for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, first as a postdoc, and now as a planetary protection engineer. It's the, probably the, <laughs> the coolest job title ever, right? <laughs> You've been there since 2010. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your job yeah. with the cool title and what Katherine Johnson means to you? So I know um, when I reached out to Dr. Mu to uh, invite her to be on this panel, we had a Zoom call, and she said, I didn't just do this but I actually have this on my desk all the time. It was the Katherine Johnson Barbie yeah. role model doll yes. that inspires her. So I just think that this is, this is so fitting to have you here. Thank you for being yeah. here. Oh, my pleasure. So yeah, planetary protection, so my job at JPL. Uh, most recently, I am still the planetary protection lead for the Mars 2020 mission. So it's my job and my team's job to make sure that when we send rovers to Mars, places that may contain life either now or in the ancient past, that we don't bring our own germs with us that could confuse our ability to search for life that is native to Mars. Um, so that's what I do at JPL, what I've been doing there for the past 13 years. Um, and then the, the way that Katherine Johnson fits into my life, I actually didn't know until the movie Hidden Figures came out how much of a path she blazed for me. Uh, I spent half of my life growing up in Hampton, Virginia. Uh, before I even went to Hampton, so we both went to Hampton University as an un undergrad. But I also went to middle school and high school there. And I remember going to a class when I first moved there, and I remember the kids around me asking, like, oh, why, why do you think you could do science and engineering? Black people haven't contributed anything to society except for stoplights and peanut butter. And I didn't have anything to reply with. I didn't know about Katherine Johnson. I didn't know about Mary Jackson. I didn't know about these amazing hidden figures. And so what she means to me to this day is that there are people out there that have blazed the trail, that have done these amazing things that I could use as a source of inspiration. Um, when I graduated high school at 16, not at 14 like Katherine Johnson, <laughs> but when I graduated early, I thought I'm just kind of out there. I'm gonna put my head down and no matter what, no matter who's in my way, the facts, the data is going to supersede everything. Doesn't matter what I look like, what my age is, I gotta go fact-based. And reading up on Katherine Johnson, that was her MO all the way. I'm like, man, I wish I knew about her. <laughs> and so my, my goal in life is to be, to highlight and amplify stories like that, and then also share my story with others to help them feel like they're not alone, future women, future girls, anybody who's interested in the space field. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. So I love this transition here because now we're going to talk a little bit about science, right? Yeah. <laughs> and about the science behind role models. Yes. Um, and so, um, India, I have known you since you were an undergraduate student mm -hmm. at IUPUI. So I won't say how long that is, but. Uh, <laughs> and I know that you were the first in your family to, to earn a PhD. And now as a professor of psychology back at IUPUI, where mm -hmm. you were an undergraduate student. Mm -hmm. And as a mother to four amazing girls, <laughs> including, <laughs> including <laughs> twins. <laughs> okay. Including twins. Um, you are a role model in your own right. Thank you. And I know that you have read and watched Hidden Figures countless times. Tell us what Katherine Johnson and other women like her mean to you and to your work. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, oh, I'm taking the moment in, and so I'm so thankful to be here. Uh, but yeah, um, I, I study role models, and I think everyone has heard the word role model before, how we tend to think about them in psychology, is it's, it's really your aspirational self, right? It's who you as aspire to be. And you know, I think sometimes people don't understand that um, when people look at the world and they don't see themselves represented, 
that they might not necessarily recognize that that means that they can still do that thing, right? Or they might not even take into account the fact that um, the world is structured such that certain groups often have access to opportunities and resources, and that's why we see them in certain positions, and maybe not others. And so um, representation means so much. Um, Katherine Johnson means so much. Um, Mike was talking about, you know, her as his grandmother made, made me think about my grandmother and mm -hmm. how much she supported me and encouraged me. Um, and role models are important because they, they help us recognize um, that we can continue to persevere, that we can continue to persist, right? Um, we make the distinction between role models and mentors. One thing that I, I like to remind people is that, you know, just seeing persons that you don't actually speak to or interact with or engage with can be enough to spark that interest in saying that, oh, I can do that thing too. Um, so it's really important for us to kind of think about, even as, you know, I'm a professor, I'm an instructor, thinking about like, who do we represent in the classroom? Who do we represent in spaces? So that all persons can see themselves represented and kind of persevere and push, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I really just wanna highlight, we'll come back to some more questions about this later on, but the fact that you know, I'm hearing this theme of numbers, right? Mm -hmm. um, and stats and evidence-based, and it's a way to challenge biases. Yeah. And so certainly the work that we do in the space of DEIB is, is, is evidence-based. Right? We rely on the research from folks like Dr. Johnson and others um, to, to inform the, the practices that we do here in this. So thank you so much. Um, I think also um, I would be remiss if I didn't share with you a little bit um, of the story of a student that joined us for lunch earlier today. I'm not sure if Summer Beasley is here. <laughs> there she is, there she is. <laughs> Um, yeah. so, so earlier we had the great fortune of being able to, to pull some of the, the leaders of, of STEM work uh, here among our student body to join us for a lunch with the panelists. And, and when I invited Summer, so I reached out to the, the deans of our STEM colleges and asked them you know, if there would be women um, who, whose lives and paths had been influenced in some way by Katherine Johnson, who would be a good representative to come to our lunch. Summer was one of those students, and when I reached out to invite her to this panel, she shared with me that prior to coming to Drexel, where she's now a student in the College of Computing and Informatics, she worked at the Department of Environmental Protection and kept a photo of Katherine Johnson's NASA badge taped to her computer so that every day when she went into work, she was inspired by that. And as a black woman in STEM, she said this inspired her every single day. And so role models absolutely matter. We have the research on it. We have living examples of it. So thank you for letting me share that, Summer. Yeah. Latasha. Hi. <laughs> um, you are an alumna of and now work extensively with the Women in Natural Sciences, or WINS, love that acronym too, uh, program at the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University. Can you tell us about that program and specifically your story? Um, how did you connect with WINS? Uh, what did that experience, kind of being with other people who shared your identities and seeing them engage in science mean to you as a young black woman? Sure. Um, Women in Natural Sciences, or WINS, you'll hear it called uh, today, is a, um, a science enrichment program that is for underrepresented girls in the School District of Philadelphia. It was founded in 1982, so we just celebrated 40 years of young women going into STEM careers and having access to STEM um, at, in, in general at all. And so, um, Unlike, not as impressive as Katherine Johnson, I call my, my experience at WINS a community of firsts. Um, and so it was the first time that I traveled outside of the country. Um, in my second year of WINS, I traveled to Belize to study marine, marine ecosystems and marine biology for about two weeks. I got a scuba diving license while I was there um, at 16. And so it was something that I had never experienced before. So that was a first. I got my first paycheck at the Academy of Natural Sciences. Um, I worked as a museum explainer and um, working to explain some of the curated, um, I'm sorry, explain, explain what was going on in the museum with the exhibits. Um, and first, um, I'm the first WINS alumni to be appointed to the board. Um, and be a board trustee, and so, like Ms. Johnson, but again, not as impressive, um, you know, she was a mathematician who calculated trajectories for the first American to go into space. 
the first um, American to orbit the planet. And so um, her legacy, although I did not know it then at 16, I, I had no idea who she was. I'm grateful to know who she is now, um, but was exposed to a lot of sciences and researchers at the museum at a very young age. And so at 16, 15, you were working side by side with researchers on collections. And so I had the opportunity to see that in action and come to fruition. Amazing, thank you. Dr. Cox. Hello. Hi. <laughs> so you described your experience as a student in the physics department at Drexel in the late 60s and early 70s in the book, A Legacy to Share, published by Drexel University's Black Alumni Council. This, uh, is, a this is a great read. If, uh, if you haven't um, seen a copy of this, I strongly encourage you to get one. Um, at that time, there were a few students or faculty of color at Drexel, True. and yet you were able to connect with some people who helped you navigate this environment. Can you tell us about those role models and what they meant for your success? Uh, interestingly enough, when I came into the university, I had the opportunity to meet the then uh, Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs. His name was Louis Murdoch. And uh, Louis knew me. He said, uh, Steve, I knew that you were coming because of my connection with the uh, admissions, uh, the, the Dean of Admissions. And uh, he said, in order for you to survive, you need to understand the mechanism of Drexel. You need to understand how to negotiate 10-week terms. You need to know that if you get a week behind, you're going to be too far behind to catch up. Okay, And you need to talk to some of the other upper-level students who have already gone through this process so you can become familiar with how to study and how to spend your time. Now, in addition to uh, Lewis, there was, uh, I was a physics major, physics and atmospheric science, and I had the opportunity to talk to uh, Professor Paul Kazmarczyk, who was the general lecturer for the physics department. So all of the engineers, all the science, calculus, chemistry, physics, whatever your major was, if it was in the sciences, you had to take physics. Calculus, chemistry, and physics, first term, second term, third term. And Cass said, Steve, he said, you need to understand that very few minority students are, have come to Drexel. Many of the students that are here, their parents, their brothers, their sisters have gone to Drexel. They understand the culture, and they under, they've had the advantage of old tests and things that would give you an advantage. Mm -hmm. He said, I am going to be the joker in the deck. I want you to make sure that all the African-American students, because at the time I was president of the Afro-American Society, get an opportunity to study with me and I will tutor them as they prepare for tests in physics department. Now he volunteered that. I didn't ask him for that because I was just trying to figure out how to get through physics. And, and uh, <clears throat> he, was a, uh, he was not only a mentor, he was helpful. Uh, he was a comedian. Uh, he taught physics like C-Spot Run. So if you couldn't get through physics and he was the lecturer and he spent time with you, it's because you just didn't come to class. Mm -hmm. And uh, that relationship with him and a few other faculty throughout the, uh, the institution, ba they basically understood the culture of the institution and the time that we were in. It's 1969, uh, you know, racial and issues of equity were not necessarily on the front burner because students were demonstrating all over the country. So in our environment, while the population was small, uh, we were kind of eyeballs in this larger situation. So in my department, and in many of the other departments, they made us feel like part of the family. Okay, we got to be a part of the Drexel culture and participated not only in the academic activities, but in all the departments, in the lexard, in the rifle, the gun club, which was very interesting, <laughs> and, and the other activities on campus because you can't know what's happening if you are isolated and mm -hmm. put yourself in a situation where you're not getting information. Mm -hmm. So those were some of the folks that made it possible for me to at least get started on the first step. Yeah, mm -hmm. I love that. <laughs> Don't we all need someone to, to show, share with us not only the curriculum, right, mm -hmm. and, and all that past information so that you would be as prepared as other students who had access to that, but also the hidden curriculum. You know, someone who really helped you understand 
what it took to navigate the space that you know has has been dominated by by white people and so you know uh, being able to yeah, another, another interesting point is um, my first co-op job was at GE Aerospace mm -hmm. and you know I had to get all the appropriate clearances top secret and uh, I was working in an environment where we were looking at uh, the nuclear deterrent and how we would you know take Russia out if that was going to happen and I, I, I was in an environment with people who basically stressed accuracy and dedication to the process, that this was not just a part-time job. If you're gonna do this, you understand people's lives are at stake and you really need to be committed to the process. Mm -hmm. So these were people in, already in industry, outside of Drexel, but again, the building was right across the street. Right. <laughs> right. And uh, I had uh, a kind of Katherine Johnson mentor at GE uh, an engineer by the name of Clarence Harris, who was also a physicist and an extraordinary aerodynamicist. And he spent time with me and also helped me develop a community school, which was focused on science and technology in West Philadelphia called Harambe Institute. So, I mean, the, the development of this process had to do with all of those resources who were feeding into me, helping to develop me as a scientist. Mm -hmm. India, you started talking a little bit earlier about your, your research in this space. You've published extensively on role models, and especially for women of color in STEM. So can you tell us about that work and how it complements what we're hearing here today from the panelists? Um, what are your key findings? What should yeah. we know about role models? Yeah, um, I'd be happy to. So um, I started, I guess, doing this work in 2017, 2016. <laughs> And so uh, there's a lot of work that, that looks at role models for underrepresented groups. And as you can imagine, um, you know, people recognize the importance of being able to see someone who looks like you. Um, but what me and my colleagues realized in this work is that they often lump all women together, right? And so kind of this idea that any person who, who shares that same gender identity <coughs> should be effective for any woman. Um, and you know, my colleagues and I didn't necessarily think that was the case. We thought that, you know, we recognize that women are not a monolith. There's a lot of diversity, and importantly, there's a lot of racial diversity. Um, so my collaborator on this work, Eva Pietri, she's a Latina woman, I'm a, a black woman, and we recognize in our own experiences that race and ethnicity probably was, was quite critical. Um, and, and so we kind of went into it trying to better understand who's gonna be the role model that kind of sparks that sense of interest to kind of get women to be interested in the field of STEM. And what our work has kind of consistently shown is that it's really important, at least in those early stages where someone's kind of trying to decide what, fate, you know, what area they wanna go into, um, to see role models who share that, that racial identity or, or that ethnic identity. And so for black women in particular, it's really critical to have access to individuals who share their racial identity. And I think sometimes, um, particularly when I talk to STEM audiences, this is really surprising, right? They say, well, I'm a woman, you know, that person's a woman. Surely I should be beneficial in some, in some regard. And I think it's important to recognize that, that not all people's experiences are the same, right? So black women don't experience sexism in the same way that other women experience sexism. Um, and oftentimes it's critical to have access to someone who has that shared racial identity because they recognize that there's these similarity in the experiences of discrimination. And so just like you need someone to help you kind of navigate the hidden curriculum and the culture and knowing how to study for an exam, there also are gonna be moments where you need someone to help you navigate this thing that happened that you kind of suspect is because of your race, right? The way they push back, maybe the way they question the, the, the judgments or the call that you made. And it can be really challenging to have to then go to someone and then convince that person that the thing that happened to you happened because it was actually indeed because of my race and gender versus someone who might say, ah, I kind of get that, right? So it's not doing that, that extra emotional labor. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think, you know, kind of what my work highlights is that representation is, is really critical. You know, so black women represent about six and a half percent of the United States population. They only make up about 2% of STEM jobs, right? Um, and it's not because they don't have the skills, it's not because they don't have the ability, it's not because they don't have the interest. All the, the data out there tells us that's not the case. It's because of the experiences that they often have in these spaces. And so 
making sure you have someone you can go to to tell you how to navigate that thing, to tell you how to push back, um, can be really critical. Yeah. yeah, yeah, gosh, and you know, that reminds me of our conversation again with one of the other students at lunch. I mean, if you think that this is stuff that was just happening years ago, this is happening today yeah. still, of course, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the students shared that their guidance counselor had just said, you know, I'm not sure that this is what you need to be pursuing. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a young person, you know, like 20 years old, sitting across telling us this, and, and she's an absolute rock star in her field. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that, that still happens today. Um, thank you so much. And I think, you know, of course that, to me, really um, underscores, you know, we, Kim in her introductions talked about the significance of the anti-racism task force and the work and the commitments um, that came out of that task force for all of us here at Drexel. And so what you're saying is absolutely one of those commitments is to increase the representation of faculty of color. And now we have the science to back that up, mm -hmm. that it is so critical for student success. <clears throat> Latasha, how does this idea of role models fit with the mission of WINS and with your work more broadly as a diversity and community impact consultant? Yeah, um, I would say wins, the, one of the purposes of WINS is to nurture curiosity and inquisitiveness about science and in particular STEM careers. And so um, I think WINS has done a really wonderful job of building a foundation of really brilliant and talented young women to become role models, right? So they become people who look like them and they also look up to and can follow that same path. And so I think programs like WINS, um, and there, there are other science enrichment programs, like WINS help build the capacity for role models and for people to, and women, young women, and young women in color in particular, to continue to grow that field. And so I think it's really important to have those sort of programs in our communities and organizations. Absolutely. Um, Steve, you know, similarly, <coughs> you have led the Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation in the greater Philadelphia region for many years. Tell us about that program. You've helped an extraordinary number <coughs> of students, and why broadening participation in STEM is such an important goal for us. Well, as I was sharing my, uh, my introduction to Drexel, and also with the co-op experiences, industry in science and technology, uh, what was clear to me is there were very few people who looked like me in the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, the people that I met were extraordinary people, particularly the people of color, or they wouldn't have been there. And uh, as I moved further on in my career with GE Aerospace, Boeing, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, NOAA, I had great positions and the same circumstance persisted wherever I went. So I thought that based on the education that I received at Drexel, that Drexel would be a great place to expand the opportunity for underrepresented students in Philadelphia, in an environment that I'm familiar with, in the city that I grew up in. I know the players, I know the politicians, I know the institution. So we applied for a grant that the National Science Foundation funded to the tune of $5 million for phase one, which really talked about increasing the number of underrepresented students, getting baccalaureate, baccalaureate degrees in STEM disciplines. And in five years, they wanted us to double, double the number of students that would be graduating mm -hmm. from the institutions that were involved with our alliance. Our particular alliance included Temple, Drexel, Penn, University of Delaware, Lincoln, Cheney, Delaware State Community College, and the New Jersey Institute of Technology. We were in three states. Uh, the objective was to create campus teams at each one of the universities that would focus on moving students through STEM disciplines successfully, graduating, and then moving them on to uh, master's and PhD level activity. As we started the program and uh, we had the buy-in of the presidents of all the institutions. In fact, we just recently had a governing board meeting of which President Fry is the chairman of the governing board, where we brought the presidents together and their representatives to talk about sustaining this activity that we have been doing now for 28 years. The outcome of our work and our efforts to focus on giving students the kind of support that they need, introducing them to research uh, both domestically and internationally, and also tutoring and mentoring has resulted in well over 18,000 students graduating with BS degrees, 
about 5,000 masters, and roughly a little over 700 PhDs since we started the program. It, for me, uh, all things con being considered, I've had the opportunity to have some of the greatest jobs in the world. I've always been paid well. Uh, I like what I do. I really enjoyed being a scientist. But having the opportunity to work with young people and have them come back like McGeega, PhD, mm -hmm. at, <laughs> you know, working on the space shuttle, and other students who now are tenured faculty at places like Michigan State, uh, Notre Dame, and all across the country is the best part of what I do. Absolutely. Because it means that the idea, the concept that we developed back in 1994, okay, really had impact and the net result is what we see now. Right. So this becomes a package that all of the universities that are involved, regionally and nationally, there are now 80, I'm sorry, there are 60 alliances across the country since we started this in 1994 and over 800,000 students have graduated basically in STEM because of this effort. So we wanna make sure that this is sustained over time because as a nation, we are still woefully short on the production of scientists and engineers. And because of the demographic, the largest population where they're gonna come from are gonna be underrepresented students, African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, and Pacific Rim students. And that has been our activity. It's been a, a pleasure, continues to be a pleasure. And again, I see McGee and I say, wow, <laughs> I'm there. This is where I want to be. Okay, now how do I yes. improve on the process? <laughs> um, Dr. Mu, coming back to you then. <laughs> Steve set that up really well. <laughs> here. So you also contributed to the book, A Legacy to Share. Yes. And in that book, you said that you owe much of your professional interest to Carl Sagan, yes. whose show Cosmos was something that a lot of us probably watch regularly. I, was, I loved it. It was a good, good show. You also mentioned that as a young person, you loved reading books by Stephen Hawking. Yes. And I think this is important to point out because it shows us that it's possible for people with whom we share few or no common identities can still inspire us, right? Um, what are some ways that people who do not share a similar background as you have supported you in your career and in your life? Yeah, actually, a lot of people in my life, I mean, my, my first job before I started at Hampton, I went to Dr. Jim Russell at the Center for Atmospheric Sciences, uh, and he's a Caucasian man, and I'm sitting out across from him saying, hey, can you please give me a job? <laughs> Here is this, like, snot-nosed 16-year-old straight from the street uh, who didn't know how to program at all. And he said yes, and he gave me a chance. And what that taught me is, I need to be that person in the future to give someone that doesn't have any experience a chance, but all the drive and all of the, the willingness to mm -hmm. do all of the work uh, and learn. So he taught me my first lesson in advocacy and really getting behind sponsorship in, in getting behind someone. Um, and so I hope to be that for other people, people that look like me and don't look like me, mm -hmm. um, to, to set the stage for whatever they want to be. Uh, when I talk to students, I, of course, talk about engineering, science, but I try to keep it on a general level because I'm not trying to convert everyone to be scientists and engineers, but to be the best at whatever they want to be. I want students to know that this is an option for you. You don't have to choose this path, but it's an option. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there are, I, I gain a lot of inspiration because of the, the hidden figures were hidden. Yes. So I had to find my identity in a Middle Eastern man, Carl right. Sagan, <laughs> right. and in many people that didn't look like me. And I really appreciate that, that they were there to break it down, break down the science and education, uh, science and engineering, and, and I just want to be that for, for someone else. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. India, um, building on that question, so in your work, and you alluded to this a little bit earlier, you recognize that there are not enough faculty of color um, at present for all students to see themselves in certain fields. We're, we're, we're making progress, but we're not making nearly enough progress in that space. So what does your research tell us about allies 
Right? I imagine that there are quite a few um, faculty and staff out there who are genuinely motivated to support and be allies to students with minoritized identities. According to your findings, how can they best communicate that support? Ah, that's a big question. Uh, yeah, so in our work, we kind of recognize that, yeah, there's not enough faculty of color to kind of be, you know, and not only is there not enough, but they sh shouldn't have to bear the responsibility right. of being the persons that kind of mentor and support students. And so allyship is uh, critical. I think like one thing that, you know, faculty, um, particularly white faculty should recognize um, that um, I say this because I think sometimes they're surprised to recognize this, but don't assume that a student will automatically look at you and be like, ah, there's an ally, right? You know, uh, and they say, what do you mean? Um, why wouldn't a student? And you know, um, I, I like to joke when we're having serious conversations, and so sometimes I say, well, have you met like white people, like in general, as a, as a whole, as a group, right? Can you think about maybe some, I don't know, specific experiences that might lead someone to say, ah, I need to kind of test the waters and see if this is someone I can trust. And so I think as educators in particular, we should, we should try to make sure that we're, we're really clear and we signal that we value those kinds of things. So even as simple as thinking about um, who do you assign students to read, right? So when students look at the list of readings, do they see themselves represented? Do you talk about how science can be used to um, address systemic racism? Are those the types of topics that come up in STEM classrooms? Or is it considered a topic that is completely divorced from thinking about science and engineering? Like, those things matter, and we recognize that for um, racially minoritized students, they're very vigilant, and they're also often looking for cues of safety. And these cues can, can kind of um, signal, oh, this person is an ally, and then that person will be more likely to approach you and kind of engage. I also tell you know, faculty, make sure that you do the work too. So for example, do you invite students to coffee? Have you invited students to get involved in undergraduate research? Are you trying to do your part to foster that science identity, to tell a student that I see something in you, this will, this will help you move you closer to your goals? Like reach out to them, it works both ways. And so you know, part of being um, an anti-racist is, is taking action. And so, you know, if you feel as though you have a responsibility to uh, address that, and I think we all should, you have to make sure that you're doing the work to kind of help students recognize that it really does take a village, right? Like, you should have your role models, you should have those persons who are your aspirational selves, but we really need a whole group of people supporting us because you never knew, know who has access to the things you need to advance your career. And so try to be that for students as much as you can, but be very intentional in those actions. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's such an important point. Um, you know, students are absolutely paying attention to our behavior. They're paying attention to everything that we say. Um, and if you if you aren't intentional, then you're just leaving open the attributions that they're making, right? Like they don't have any idea whether you're a person who is trustworthy or not. I think about um, examples of um, you know, in my mind, I know as I was teaching that I'm a first generation college student, and you know, I walk into that classroom space with that with that knowledge. But here I was also, you know, I always thought it was really important when I was in the classroom to, to dress professionally, to model the kind of behavior, the professional look that I wanted students to, to see themselves doing in the future. And, and so, you know, I, I remember the first time that I had a conversation with a student who was just like, you're not a first generation student, you dress too nice. Mm. And I thought, whoa, <laughs> let's have a conversation. They thought that college was not for them, you know? And I was like, well, I didn't know if it was for me either, but here we are. So it turned out I kept going, right? <laughs> so yeah, thank you, India. Um, Mike, although we focused on STEM so far today, your industry, finance, mm -hmm. is also one that has not had significant representation of people of color historically. So how did you find success in that space, and what can we do to open more doors for students who might question whether they belong in finance? How much time do you have? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're, we're good. You, you. Full disclosure, in my heart and in my training, I'm STEM all the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, my undergrad degree you is had in to computer be. science, yeah. <laughs> um, and I do have an MBA, mm -hmm. and I also have a law degree, That's right. but even that is an intellectual property patent, um, mm -hmm. technology and innovation. Mm -hmm. um, 
finance is no different from anything else in that there are certain disciplines that are transferable throughout. I mean, even at NASA, you have IT support, engineering, design, architecture, those kind of things. Same thing exists on the campus level. Um, but to be more specific, um, and I think I heard um, about the visual, about role models. Mm -hmm. um, I was the first African-American architect that the bank ever hired, and it wasn't that long ago, it was 2010. Yeah. And I was also one of the first directors uh, that was African-American in the technology field at the bank. And I can recall when I got promoted, I got phone calls from people I'd never met before in the bank that were so excited to look up on the, you know, the jumbotron when they're doing a big uh, conference call and to see somebody that looked like yeah. them. Yeah. Right? And um, one lady was crying on the phone, right? and I was, wow. You know? And I realized that um, visually seeing a possibility mm -hmm. is sometimes all people need to have faith and belief yes. that there's an opportunity for them. Right? Up until then, yes. they will just go through the motions mm -hmm. and they will you know, do their best, they'll be professionals. But in their heart of hearts, they don't feel at all that there's an opportunity to advance, to grow, to move, to have access. Um, and sometimes for all the money and rewards that organizations hand out to their workforce to try to motivate them and inspire them to perform, oftentimes all they really have to do is issue authentic hope and possibility to a workforce that doesn't, I mean, everybody likes cash, I mean. I, <laughs> um, but you want to see um, a cultural shift in innovation in an organization. Show the organization that there's an opportunity for all of them to grow in advance if the effort meets the opportunity. And you save a lot of money, right? And so, you know, my answer to your question is the way you create that kind of culture, number one, is to have courageous leadership. Um, I meet a lot of executives um, who sound fabulous. They do. I mean, they sound like they mean it. They sound like they're focused. But it's not what you say. It's what you do. Don't tell me about your diversity and inclusion plans for innovation in 2024. Mm -hmm. Show me your execution goals and objectives and how you measure against those in 23. Mm -hmm. And then show me your board of directors. Right. right? Yep. Don't talk to me about diversity and inclusion and there are no women, no people of color on your board. Right. Don't talk to me about doing business in Central America and in Africa and Asia and then all you do is send old men and old white guys in a plane over to the other continent to try to do business. Yeah. I mean, not only is it disrespectful, but it's disingenuous and it's not even fundamentally appropriate for doing business. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, that's the first part. Mm -hmm. The other part is realizing that in an ever-changing environment, the old models no longer always apply. Right? You have to be not only innovative in technology and research, you have to be innovative with leadership mm -hmm. and people, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And people management and how you connect to your workforce and how you motivate them and drive them and get them to perform. Mm -hmm. This is not the olden days of do it because I said so or I'm going to fire you. Most companies in the world can't even fire people when they want to anymore. It takes a year, <laughs> PDPs, and evaluation. We've all worked with folks on our team that are dead weight. We can't get rid of them to save our life. Right? Right. And so we have to evolve in every aspect of the way we work and function, not just in the lab or not just at the computer, but in HR, right? In our executive training. I asked you how much time you had. Yeah, I, okay. I mean. Okay. All right, I'll stop there. The message is clear, right? If we okay. want to see some change, then we have to embrace that change. It's top right? down. Yeah, it's absolutely. Top down. Absolutely. Mm -hmm.
I'm coming back to you, but I, th I think you may okay. have actually partly answered my question, but okay. uh, I want to give you a chance to expand on that. So your grandmother's story is truly one about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, the theme of this President's Speaker Series. So what can we each do to honor her legacy and make society more equitable and inclusive? Oh, wow, that's good. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, um, my grandmother did not do self-pity. Um, when I was five, if I fell, I said, get up. <laughs> now, she was still loving. I mean, I don't yeah, mean to imply yeah. that she was hardcore, but she was more focused, always focused on the mission, right? Whether the mission was getting you ready for the after school program to do your poem, or it was, you know, Fourier transforms and differential equations to get ready to bring man back from the moon. It was all the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mastering your craft, being good at what you do, mm -hmm. pursuing excellence in every aspect, mm -hmm. um, and then being available to those that needed your assistance. She, I don't ever recall her saying no if it started with, Grandma, can you help me? Like, mm -hmm. under no circumstance. Mm -hmm. And so being available, um, not just to the people that you know, to the people that you love, but anybody that shows interest. You ever, never realize who you can give a spark to that will go on and do something absolutely amazing just for the mere fact that you just got them going just a little bit, Yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so you never know, they say you never know what someone's going through when you meet them somewhere. Mm -hmm. You never know what small, um, spark you can give somebody who ends up being a great scientist or a great researcher. You don't know. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Latasha, similar question for you. So as a diversity and community impact consultant, mm -hmm. I like saying that, it's <laughs> nice. <laughs> what would you say is something that we each can do to make society more equitable and inclusive? Um. I would say uh, in my work in, in DEI with organizations, um, a lot of times you hear DEI or DEIB and all these different acronyms, but particularly diversity, when you hear it, all too often it means for organizations differences. And so I oftentimes ask them to think in it, think of a different, an alternate viewpoint. Instead of focusing in on our differences that we should perhaps focus in and hone in on our sameness. And I think when we hone in on the human element of each of us and our sameness, that you could build capacity and empathy to be able to glean from one another in your differences. And so I think a lot of times, you know, diversity work um, is difficult, right? It's a lot of hand wringing and mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of calling to the carpet a lot of times. But I think if you operate in kindness, um, and you focus on the sameness that you have with the people that you're working with that you can glean from the differences that you have. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dr. Mu, yeah. I'm gonna ask you the same thing but at a, at a different level here. So as planetary protection engineer, <laughs> what do you think we can do to make our planet more inclusive and equitable? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that uh, we can do, uh, one of the things I pass on when I talk to students is question the rules. And I agree with the one plus one equals two no matter what, mm -hmm. but then some of these engineers are doing these things like, I thought, uh, we're allowed to do that? Uh, they push the limits beyond what is traditional because they question the rules, like, I think I can push this a little bit farther because I still meet the intent of that rule. That's what I feel Katherine Johnson did. She pushed the rules, she pushed the limits because she wanted to get something done. And if we realize that Yes, there's a playbook, and it's a different playbook than what we taught. And if I can allow myself to think outside of the box, that'll really get you to new places. It'll have you thinking in ways that will allow for a helicopter be, to be sent to Mars or to help this world be a better place and an equitable place. Um, so that's what I usually ta tell students. But then also another thing is to leverage the power of our allies. Uh, I used to be, as of January, I was the uh, president of the Black Employee Resource Group at JPL. 
And one of the things that we did, one of our successes last year, was bringing in a DEIA manager. And one of her amazing, amazing contributions uh, came from the fact that we fought and our allies fought together, our Native American um, ERG, our uh, uh, women in engineering ERG, everyone, all veterans, we all came together and said, this is the thing we're all fighting for mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. And because we have that new DEIA manager, we have new tangible quantifiable goals like mm -hmm. increasing the black engineer population at JPL. We, and she put the chart with data and everything that shows the dwindling population. Mm -hmm. So now we can measure progress. So leveraging your allies allows you to do great things, amazing things. So that yeah. would be the other thing. It takes a village, <laughs> yeah. yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Steve, as we wrap up our conversation today, I'm thinking about all the things that are known to influence well-being. We've talked about belonging today, but one other important factor in well-being is gratitude. For what are you grateful? <laughs> well, as I was thinking about uh, gratitude, uh, first I have to thank God that God gave me an opportunity to do what I do. Uh, my father was a tough guy. If you got a 98, he said, well, if you got a 98 right, you could have got two more. What's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> And, and as I look at the, the circumstances that occurred to me as I was in high school when the guidance counselor told me not to apply to Drexel because he thought I should do something different, he didn't think that was in my best interest, I couldn't compete, uh, the script had already started being written about what I was going to do. I was going to challenge anybody who challenged me mm -hmm. and told me that I couldn't do something. Mm -hmm. uh, I had good parental support. So they would say, hey, listen, you just let us know what you want to do, something we'll help you any way we can. Okay? And then, as I came to the university and I met some faculty, like I saw Paul Kazmarczyk, who said, yeah, Steve, there's some things that you need to know in order for you to make this trip. So I started putting together all of these activities and all of this input that I was getting from people, the good and the bad. And I, one, one breakout comment, when I was a sophomore here, I was asked to speak to the Delaware Valley guidance counselors, 250 guidance counselors, about what the college was doing to bring more students into the university, particularly in the sciences. I spoke for the dean, and as I looked up in the audience, I noticed my guidance counselor was there. Mm -hmm. The very same person like, who told me not to apply. Oh. And I said, God is good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that, uh, that circumstance was another part of the script, all part of taking me the direction that I was supposed to go in. Yes. So, you know, here, many years later, and I have to tell you, in October, I'll be 75 years old. I never thought I would live this long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I, I figured 50 might have been my run. You know, the fact that I made it a few more years is a good thing. And uh, I believe that there was a reason, and the, the gratitude really comes from all those people that invest in me, uh, my parents, the Lord, and, and everyone else really shaped the thing that, I made, that made me know that I can help some more students and some more people, okay, do better. Yeah. Uh, I remember one day, a young lady came to my office, uh, a Korean student, and she was crying. I mean, she was in distress. I said, wait a minute, you got, just got to sit down and calm down. So we talked. And she felt, as many underrepresented students feel, that she didn't belong here. And I said, well, why do you think that? Well, you know, I don't fit in. Everybody's different. And I, so we talked for a while. And I talked to her about her family and her parents and where she came from. But at the end of the day, after we talked, she went back. She talked to her guidance counselor at Drexel, and she started getting involved with some of the other social activities that I suggested, which made a difference. And she graduated, and now she's on Wall Street, yes. and she's doing great. And I said, well, you know, the, the thing that I'm promoting is belief in self. Mm -hmm. Okay, believe in God, but believe, also believe in self. Mm -hmm. And she did that, and it made a difference. So I said, well, this is a good tool to help anybody make it. And that is the kind of the premise of all of this work that we, I've been doing. And I think that many of us 
have had to live with. Because I, I bet you that no one here on the stage did not have someone tell them that they could not make it. It happens all the time. Just one denigrating statement can take all of the energy out of an individual and make them go a different path. I mean, certainly when I grew up, I was in the, it was the middle of the gang war era in Philadelphia. So people weren't living long. That's why I'm ta I was talking about my short term on the planet. And uh, you know, the fact that I could overcome that wasn't because I was so smart, it was because I had a lot of help, a lot of guidance, okay? And I wanted to make sure that I did as much as I could to provide that for everyone else. Yes, thank you. Natasha, for what are you grateful? Um, I am grateful, first of all, for being here today with all of you. Um, I'm grateful for being asked to be on the panel um, for the story and life of Katherine Johnson, um, whoever created Hidden Figures and made the movie and the book. Um, I don't know those authors, but whoever did it, bringing her life to light so that we all understand what was happening. Um, I am grateful for all of the people that decided to pull up as they climbed. Um, I am a, a recipient of that, and I will continue to do the same. Thank you. <laughs> India, you know this is coming your way now. Oh, <laughs> for, what are you, for what are you grateful, India? Um, um, Y'all have given such beautiful answers. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I think um, two things. So one, the first that comes to mind is the future, right? So uh, Leslie spoke about the luncheon that we had earlier today and you know, seeing these young black women in these STEM fields who are already so incredibly talented and I know a few of them are here and one of the things I tell my four daughters all the time is one, you are your ancestors' wildest dreams and then two, you already possess everything you need in this world to be successful. It is in you, so just keep pushing and so I, I, I just left that so inspired um, and then the second thing that um, I'm grateful for, um, partly because I got a, a rejection for a, a, a peer reviewed paper this morning, um, but is, <laughs> is failure, right? Mm -hmm. So I think like it's also important to recognize that as part of this journey and this process, you're gonna fail. I always tell students that fail stands for first attempt in learning, and that in every moment you can learn from it, so reflect and reset and move forward, right? Like failure is part of the journey. And so um, you will encounter temporary setbacks, but just keep going, keep pushing. So those are two things I'm grateful yeah. for. Thank you, excellent. Uh, what am I grateful for? Uh, it's weird, I don't know. Every time I wake up, I'm always grateful to just be alive. <laughs> and that might sound weird, but just I wake up, I wiggle my fingers, I wiggle my toes, I'm like, okay. We're good, because <laughs> there are so many yes. people that don't get that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so there's now your chance to make a change, to make a difference uh, on this planet and beyond, maybe. Um, and so that's what I'm grateful for, is being alive and having the ability to interact with someone, to meet new amazing people, the, the students, I agree, the, the hope in the future. I mean, there's just so much I'm impressed about with the, the next generation coming up. You all are doing better than, the, than me, than my generation, and I just have such great hope for the future in you all. Absolutely. Great. Mike, what about you? Ah, um, I'm going to cheat a little bit. Um, <laughs> two things, um, the village and struggle. Right. Um, and, and I'd like to apologize because I should have done this early. One of the most key important elements of my village is my aunt, my Aunt Jolette, who's actually my grandmother's oldest daughter. She's in the audience in the front row. <laughs> um, and I say the village, and then there are subcomponents to that. Right? Um, I'm a neighborhood guy. I grew up in a pretty rough hood section called Dodtown in East Orange, New Jersey. And I didn't realize how valuable um, the lessons learned in that environment were going to be mm. in terms of power of discernment, the ability to identify uh, friends and foe, influencers, decision makers, pretenders, hangers on. Um, and, I, and I think I allowed um, uh, the mainstream world to let me think that that was a negative. 
um, my origin, where I came from, mm. what I was building from, as opposed to um, an aid and assist. Yeah. Yeah. But I also appreciate, and I'm grateful for struggle, because without struggle, I wouldn't push. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. You never saw an athlete right. um, that didn't work out yeah. excel. Yeah. Right? And so in order, what struggle gives you is motivation to lift weights, to run longer, to run faster, to push. Mm -hmm. Without struggle, I wouldn't have gone back to get an MBA, right? Yeah. Because in corporate America, when they keep telling you no, you figure out ways to not allow them to say no. Mm -hmm. So then you look and you're the only one in your group with an MBA, right? mm -hmm. but you still can't move. So you go back with the struggle and you go chase something else. And mm -hmm. so um, you get a law degree or you get another graduate or whatever. And then you come back like the kid that's trying to impress their parents to stop watching mm -hmm. TV and watch them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you go, ta-da, and no one looks up. <laughs> <laughs> So you go back and you work on something else, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so you look at struggle as a frustrating thing that limits you. But in reality, it's training ground to prepare you when the opportunity comes yeah. to blast right past everybody. Mm -hmm. Because you've been, you've been working out, we talked about this. You've been That's working right. out for however many years, waiting, mm -hmm. yep. right? Yep. And so while everyone else seemed like they were cruising along with no struggle, they wonder why they're so ill-prepared when they get an opportunity and they just stay in the middle of the room looking confused. Yeah. Meanwhile, that one female who never gets a chance, or that one person of color who lives and works in an organization where nobody looks like them, mm -hmm. when someone finally hands them one, I mean, they take off like a rocket. Yeah. They've been training all of this time, waiting mm -hmm. for an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so embrace that struggle. Yeah. Realize that it doesn't have to be a negative. It can be your time in the gym right. before the game. Yeah, thank you. Well, I know I am so grateful to each of our panelists. I am grateful to all of you for joining us. I think we have some time for questions. There are a couple of microphones here, if you wouldn't mind approaching the microphone, please, so that we can all hear your question. Hi, this is in honor of the award-winning playwright, uh, Lorraine Hansberry. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to give you a controversial quote, because you can't be a good playwright if you don't stir things up. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to do the quote, and I'm going to ask anybody for a quote that um, has helped them. And it's either like a controversial or just a simple one. I mean, anybody, um, and I'm kind of curious about what your grandmother, if she, she might have some quotable quotes. So. Oh, God. <laughs> um, maybe? One, I'm kidding, I'm being sarcastic, sorry. Okay, here we go. Uh, the thing that makes you exceptional, if you are at all, is inevitably that which must also make you lonely. Okay. <laughs> and so, um, well, my grandma had a famous one I think we all know by heart by now, which is, um, you're as good as anyone else and no one else is better than you, mm -hmm. right? And, and frankly, what that means is never feel like you're superior to anyone, but don't let anyone make you feel like you don't deserve to be in the room. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I can think of uh, probably the most prophetic thing I remember from my dad was there are no shortcuts to the right way. Mm. If you're going to do it, you got to do it right. That's right. If you made a mistake, go back and do it again. Get it right. That's the 98-100 rap. <laughs> <laughs> I think about Maya Angelou, right? Do the best that you can until you know better. And when you know better, do better. That's right. first black communications director at an organization that's been around for nearly 40 years. 
And for the last year or so, I have been um, the co-chair of the DEIB committee. Mm -hmm. A month ago today, I was promoted to the organization's executive team. And so I'm one of six people, one of the only person of color. But as a result of that, the DEIB uh, uh, committee uh, decided to remove me from being the chair because of my increased authority mm -hmm. uh, with the executive team. So I'm curious about what your all's thoughts are about power dynamics within in the office as it relates to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Because from my perspective, I thought that this possibly was a really unique, positive opportunity for the organization to have the only person of color on the executive team also be a co-chair of the committee but I also understand that there's different power, that power that have, dynamics at play. So I'm curious on your thoughts. Go ahead, I'll jump in later. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I'm, a, I'm a teacher at heart. So I always say, you know, I always ask students, when you say power, what does power mean? And power is access to resources, right? Um, and so power can look like a lot of different things, and I think that when we're thinking about this from the diversity, equity, inclusion perspective, it's recognizing that some people, because of just by mere fact of their positionality, don't have access to power and capital in some spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like maybe your organization isn't thinking about power in that way, like they're thinking about it in terms of you're an authority figure, your status, the hierarchy that's inherent to organizations. Um, but I always, um, I'm taking a, thinking about your playbook, right? Um, question the rules and push back because it sounds like a really unique opportunity for someone who is in this high level position who also maybe understands the perspectives of persons who have experiences that look a, a lot like yours. But I think that this is, a dynamic that a, a lot of us probably have found ourselves in, right? So when you are the one and only, you know, you're already grappling and dealing with that. And as you move upward, it's like, well, where can I show up? Where can I not show up? But I think that, you know, my, my default is to always push back and always to have like yes or no people, right? Like people in the organization, people outside the organization. Leslie is, is one of my yes and no people. So like no matter what happens, I usually immediately go and say, okay, am I tripping? Yeah. No, no, they tripping. Okay, I thought so, let's, yeah. let's move, right? Yeah. So, so being able to have someone else who can kind of help guide and say like, let me push that back, push back because I think that maybe the organization is missing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's really a unique opportunity, yeah. yeah. I, I don't disagree with any of that. Yeah. I would say the dynamics of the group is, is also important, right? Mm -hmm. Because those groups function differently in organizations mm -hmm. differently. Yeah. Um, if it is the type of organization where there's a lot of... Um, Friction? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> friction is a good word. Yeah. But certainly, particularly being critical of leadership about decisions that are being made, um, of course not. I mean, I wouldn't want executive leadership necessarily present in that space either. Uh, what I would encourage you to think about, though, is there's a positive aspect of them not wanting you in there. What that means is, number one, you truly have arrived, right? Because you'd have to ask yourself a question. If they still wanted you in the room, then you may not be as executive or as leader as you think you are only because you can't usually operate in both spaces at the same time easily. Not that it can't be done, it's just very difficult. Yeah. And so um, I know, you know, at, at Truist, we have those organizations, and what we have is senior executive sponsorship, right? And so there are segments and times when they engage with those committees, mm -hmm. and then they know that there's this, I don't know, no one actually blows the whistle, but there's a period at which they exit stage right because they've done their piece, they've participated, but now those folks still need to be able to function in their subcommittee mode and do the work that they were intended to do without fear of retribution or fear of you know, senior leadership looking over them. So I wouldn't necessarily see it as a completely negative thing, but more of um, a reality to where you're going, where you've been and where you've arrived at. And then you re-engage with them, right? And almost like, okay, I know you don't want me in the room for certain things, but I want to support and sponsor you and you need to have that visibility 
on the senior executive level. Let me represent your concerns in that way and be a sponsor to your committee as opposed to another member. So you're still connected, there's still a hierarchical relationship, um, and you can still operate in both spaces without feeling like you're giving up something to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I understand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I want to double down on that too. And that's how our ERGs are structured at JPL, where we have leadership in the different communities of inclusion, and then we have executive council sponsors that elevate our concerns up to the executive level. And that doesn't stop that person from attending however many meetings they want to, mm -hmm. <laughs> still acting on our behalf. Uh, but that that separates that power dynamic. Yeah. I have a quick question. I don't think I need the mic at this point. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I know the movie kind of depicts uh, your grandmother as always, and as you indicated, she was on a mission uh, at all times. And, uh, and I often uh, refer to a talk show I listened to, Cheryl Lee Ralph and Senator Vincent Hughes. Uh, they always, most every time they say, always be ready, she don't have to get ready. Mm -hmm. It sounds like your grandmother mm -hmm. was, was, was uh, pretty much on point with that. Mm -hmm. uh, has she ever discussed with you what was the most challenging experience she had and how did she overcome it? Well, um, it's kind of anticlimactic because it wouldn't have anything to do with NASA or space or science. <laughs> um, and primarily, you, you sort of have to understand the, the time in history um, when she was most active, um, NACA was still a part of the Department of Defense, so everything was highly secreted. Mm -hmm. She never talked about that stuff. Even when the movie came out, she didn't talk about it unless you forced her to answer a specific <laughs> question. <laughs> um, because to her, her mission, what was important was my aunt and us mm -hmm. and church mm -hmm. and her sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha, and her mm -hmm. alumni association and the students who were local who wanted her tutelage, and the neighbor across the street that couldn't get their taxes done. I mean, she was about community, about supporting that. And oh, by the way, she was a genius. But that wasn't her main function. It was just a piece of who she was and who we later found out um, you know, what she did. I mean, there were people at NASA who knew all about her, but it just stayed in the building. They knew who she was. I, I, as a matter of fact, I was on LinkedIn last month, and periodically I go out and I look for posts on my grandmother. And to be frank, I, to be honest, I, I, I look to see who's inaccurate or who's talking trash, and then I go after mm. them. <laughs> but um, I, I try to, um, when, when I see students or when I see people that say things that I think are either different or poignant or important, I let them know that we appreciate it, or I let them know, you know, maybe that that's not quite how it happened, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but there's always this one person who says, "Oh man, I got I got twelve copies of her papers." I ran into a guy who's got every paper she's ever written. Um, he's trying to get an electronic form and send it to me in email. I mean, she's got, I don't know, it's got to be like 30-something, 40-something mm -hmm. published papers. And we're not going to even count the ones that women weren't allowed to, exactly. to right. put That's their names on the public. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and real quickly, I'll say this, and, and I, racism and sexism has cost this country a great deal mm -hmm. for a long time. And I want you to imagine if you had a, a serious disease and you're in the hospital, and you know how medical teams work. There's a surgeon, an anesthesiologist, a nurse. Everybody's in there. And they're, they're stra strategically trying to figure out how they're going to treat you, how they're going to run the surgery and everything else. Now, could you imagine if this was 1954 and your surgeon um, was a black male, and your anesthesiologist was Jewish and the nurse was white, and they weren't allowed to work together in the same building. The Jewish doctors had to be across the street. The nurses had to be on that side. And by the way, the black doctor wasn't even invited to be in the building. Mm -hmm. 
you'd be dead, right? And several times this country has almost died with their commitment to isolation, mm -hmm. segregation, and exclusion, and exclusive practices, right? Um, we have missed out. I mean, we probably would have gone to the moon years mm -hmm. sooner than we did mm -hmm. if they let my grandmother in the room, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And so there's value in diversity, not only because it's fair, but because the quality of the solutions, the quality of the debate, the quality of the answer is always going to be that much better mm -hmm. when you have differing opinions mm -hmm. and an opportunity to measure and test ideas. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that if you're in a bubble, refusing to hear from anybody else or only wanting to be in a room with folks that look like you mm -hmm. or a grocery shop where you shop or go to the church that you go to. Mm -hmm. That's the reality, is that diversity um, is important for survival and winning, if nothing else. Even if you don't care about people, you might care about the bottom line and the profit margin. You have to do it. There's no need not to. I think um, with that, we will we'll close. I want to, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Oh, two, sorry. <laughs> okay. Hi, um, thank, um, thank you for being here, everyone. Um, I got a chance to meet you guys at lunch today, so it was awesome. Um, I guess I just wanted to, I had a fangirl girl moment. Um, so I guess, I, so for me, um, my grandmother, my mother, and my family, they've always been strong. And um, as I got older, I started to realize who they were and the path that they um, paid for me. And so I guess for the question, I question I have for you is, did you always realize the, you know, the path that your grandmother helped pay for you? And for the rest of you guys, did you um, have somebody that also helped pay, or did you pay attention to um, someone who helped pave the way for you? Because I feel like, um, even though like a lot of us here, my generation here, like we're doing great things, it was because of you guys. You know, we, it wasn't easy. So it was because you guys paved the way for us. So yeah, that's the question. Well. Real quick, I'm still walking the path that my grandmother's paving even in her death today. Yes. Um, there's still rooms that I get invited into, tables that I get a chance to sit at. Um, frankly, not because I got a doctorate in the law or because I got an MBA, but because I'm Katherine Johnson's grandson. And frankly, I'm old enough now and, and confident enough that frankly, I don't care how I got in the room. When I was young, I was concerned about that. Oh, they're going to think I didn't, blah, blah, blah. I did my work, mm -hmm. right? I just want to get in the room because really getting in the room doesn't keep you there. It just gets you in there. And that's all any of us want anyway, right? If, if you have the talent and the capability, you'll stay in the room once you get in there, right? So that, that, that is, I'm still walking. She's still paving. She's long gone. And she's still out there dynamiting mountains and blowing holes and stuff even today. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, one more question. Yes, thank well, you. I, I wanted to ask congratulations to all the panelists and the different levels of success. And thank Drexel University for putting on this series. The thing that I was listening to in terms of uh, your discussion and your conversation is that being in leadership, being out front, is a lonely position. <laughs> how do y'all as leaders, how did y'all deal with the uh, isolation when you were going through your different disciplines so that you can pass that type of information on to those that are coming behind you? I didn't feel as lonely till now. <laughs> 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 um, when I talk to the, the next generation of scientists, engineers, I try to emphasize that you know, it's not the microwave mentality. We, when you go for something, for example, the, the mission that I worked on from concept to launch was eight years. And so you have to set little goals for yourself. You have to set little finish lines to help you feel those warm feelings that you need to as you continue through your journey. And for us, it was all of the small reviews. We had preliminary design review, critical design review. We had a pre-launch review. We had, all of these reviews were my little finish lines 
that kept me going and kept the loneliness from setting, setting in. <laughs> so just having those mental goals really helps. Yeah, I mean, I just echo that. I think the best leaders are listeners, right? So you listen to the people around you. Um, and I think that celebrating every part of the journey and having the people around you celebrate every part of the journey, the, the struggle, the failure, the positives, the ups and downs is what sustains you. And I also am a big person um, that likes to reflect on the why, mm -hmm. right? Because sometimes being leadership, sometimes being the only, sometimes being the first can be, very, can be lonely, but you have to stay grounded and think about why I'm here. So for me, I try to be the professor that I always needed and deserved. I try to be that mm -hmm. for other students. And so that's my why. And I think that in moments where it's, it's hard, that's what sustains me, that's what grounds me, that's what keeps me moving forward. Yeah, let me, uh, as a, a particular experience, uh, dealing with nine universities that have been working together for the last 28 years, and people with different attitudes and different temperaments about how you manage a particular activity. Uh, universities are very dynamic. I mean, it's, as a corporation, it's tough business. In, different opinions, it's oftentimes clash. And your ability to uh, negotiate the challenges that everyone face has a lot to do, faces has a lot to do with understanding the environment. You really have to understand the people and what the mission is, as, as uh, India was saying. Uh, because while you may be in leadership and you want to be sensitive to everyone, you need to identify what the mission is and are you on mission? Because if you're not on mission, then you lose the process altogether. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's lonely at the top. Everybody is not gonna agree with you. So the issue becomes, can you take it on the chin and keep ticking? Yep. <laughs> or do you fold and let somebody else take over? Mm -hmm. Well, that's probably not the best methodology. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> probably a few people that use that. But if you really wanna move the agenda, you have to learn how to negotiate with all the pertinent players. And uh, in a, a different life, when I was working in economic development for the city of Philadelphia, uh, it was my job to bring the bank, the real estate people, and the developer together to come up with a deal that would work. And oftentimes, they were way out of line with one another. But the theory was that if everybody could walk away and not feel like they were robbed, then you did a good job. Everybody walked away feeling happy about what the outcome was. So, you know, the challenge is the ability to make the deal. We were like Monty Hall, let's make a deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of that going on when you're in leadership and you have to learn how to negotiate that effectively. I would echo all of the sentiment said here and then I will also add, I think finding your people, right? So leadership can be difficult and lonely and all those things but i think if you find like india was talking about how leslie is her yes no person i think you have to have critical people like that in your life mm -hmm. who tell you when you are off <laughs> who tell you when you're doing all right mm -hmm. um and i think having those kind of folks around you is really helpful yeah I, that, that's perfect actually mm -hmm. um what you do is not who you are yeah. right yeah. it's just what you do Right. And so my kids could care less what my title is, mm -hmm. um, what my office looks like. They just know that, you know, today I was going to buy pizza <laughs> and they want to go to the party. Right? That's right. Um, you know, my fraternity brothers don't care where I came from before the frat meeting. Mm -hmm. Today I'm here and I got to give my report on time and I need to be within five bucks of what the number was supposed to be. As long as you're grounded and live a complete full life outside of whatever the thing is that you do, family will let you know when what you did wasn't right and they don't care where you came from or how <laughs> special you are. Um, your children will remind you what your responsibilities are. Your spouse or your significant other will tell you that you either did or didn't deliver on the promise, right? And so trying to live a complete life full of experiences is I think what keeps you from being on an island all the time. I'm sure there are going to be times you got to make decisions mm -hmm. and you're not going to be popular. I told my kids yesterday, one of y'all is always mad at me for something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've learned to live with it. I'm fine with that. Right? It means you're doing but it right. You, right, right. That's right. 
But if you if you if you if if your goal is to live a complete and full experience, the loneliness is fleeting. It's short. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and you can continue to get grounded by your village and the people around you who support your efforts both in and out of whatever field that you're in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Oh, Angela. You know, I've got to. You've got to do it. Yes, please do. A legacy to share navigating life's challenges and celebrating our greatest achievements includes stories of 56 Black Drexel dragons over the past 50 years who have succeeded across all fields and all industries. And I want to thank Dr. Mujige Cooper and Professor Steve Cox, mm -hmm. Dr. Cox, for being a part and sharing their story. All the proceeds go to Drexel students on campus today and future leaders of tomorrow. So thank you. Yes. <laughs> I want to thank Dr. President Fry for doing the forward for yes. this. All right. Thank you all so much. Thank you to our distinguished panelists. Good job. <laughs> Absolutely a pleasure. Wow. <laughs>